This is the fourth and final part of a lecture on the subject of accent formation in foreign language learning. In the very first segment, I talked about some of the underlying phonetic principles, and in the second installment, I talked about some of the techniques and resources that we have at our disposal as we try to develop good accents in foreign languages as we learn them. And in the uh, last time, in the, in the third part, uh, the preceding video, I analyzed some of my own accents uh, that I had offered uh, samples of as, as I read texts uh, and presenting my Germanic uh, language series uh, and received feedback and criticism indicating that some accents were good and some were not so good and analyzed in terms of uh, what I had done to develop them uh, and uh, the effort I had put into developing them. And so in this final video, I want to conclude by discussing the advisability and the desirability of keeping a realistic perspective of this uh, entire realm of, of uh, foreign language learning, uh, covering the subjects of uh, what you can realistically expect to attain, uh, what you should desire to attain, and the way that uh, we, we judge others and regard the attainments of others. So to begin with, let me offer a narrative um, descriptive sort of ladder or scale of uh, kinds of accents that people can have that we can sort of think about and refer back to as we discuss the, the topic in some detail. I think that the, uh, the, the, the worst kind of accent that a person can have is uh, at the stage when you're completely unintelligible. That is, when even though you have studied a language and you do know enough of it to try to speak and communicate with it, it just doesn't work. People don't understand you because your pronunciation is so thick, so off, so different from what they expect to hear. Uh, a slight step above that would be when you're no longer completely unintelligible, but when there are real problems with your intelligibility such that you have to repeat yourself in order to be understood at all, and then even when you do repeat yourself, perhaps rather than being understood, you're misunderstood. That is, because of your pronunciation, you say one thing and they think and understand, hear you saying another thing. Um, these are obviously extremely problematic, uh, non-functional levels of, of accent and formation. Getting a little bit better would be uh, a level of accent that is no longer a true barrier to communication the way these two are, but which is a hindrance because um, you still have a very thick accent and uh, perhaps people who know you and are used to the way you speak uh, don't need to pay particular attention, but when you first meet a new person, they certainly do because the, the rhythm, the lilt is so off from what they expect. Um, and frankly speaking, at this level, uh, sometimes people talk about, and I think it's true, the, 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 the possible charm of a foreign accent. You certainly don't have it at this level. Rather than charm, your, your accent is frankly ugly. It, it would grate on the ears of people who just wouldn't like to hear their language sounding the way you make it sound. And so on some psychological level, you're not engendering goodwill when you talk to people. It's, it's frustrating for them to have to listen to you. Um, so again, this, this level of accent is still very problematic. Um, getting a little bit better would be the kind of accent that people have and maintain when they are utterly unable to break out of that point of uh, resonance in their mouth, the focal point of the energy of their native language, and even though they may learn the uh, pronunciation of specific phonemes in their new language, they still pronounce them with that, that old base of uh, pronunciation, base of resonance, such that uh, their accent is very much stereotypical uh, from wherever they are, and people who are familiar with that will be able to peg them uh, almost instantly when they open their mouth and say one one word or two, people will then know that you are from wherever you are. Um, so at this level, your accent is no longer a problematic barrier to communication, but uh, it might be a psychological uh, problem for people to be stuck at this level of pronunciation when you can be identified as, as what you are. Uh, if you can get a little bit better than that, then perhaps you'll no longer be, uh, again, immediately identifiable as being precisely from where you are, but you'll still be immediately identifiable as being a foreigner. That is, um, your accent will be such that it's not a, uh, an impediment to communication at all, but it will be one of the very first things that people notice about you human beings, when we interact with other human beings, we just register all sorts of uh, information 
about the the age and the the, the gender and the appearance and uh, all other things about the the person who's talking to us and one of these is their their accent and pronunciation so at this next level your accent would be strong enough that that would be one of the most distinctive features about you the one of the things that they would uh, notice and describe you if they had to recall some of the people they met that day uh, when you came to mind, the first thing they would say, oh yeah, a foreigner, uh, somebody who, who spoke with a, a, a different accent. Uh, getting a little bit uh, better in terms of the accent scale or um, ladder would be a point when, I think this is, I mentioned charm before, about this stage is when charm would really start to enter into the picture when uh, you still obviously have an accent, but it's not at all a factor in most communication, uh, such that it's not one of the first things that uh, people would notice about you and recall about you. Again, using the same analogy that I just did, if somebody's asked to recall uh, some of the people they met that day and they're thinking about you, they would say, well, it was a, uh, a, a young man uh, well-dressed, uh, soft-spoken, had a somewhat of a, maybe a European accent, you know, it would come along those lines. Um, and then uh, I think even getting more polished and refined would be, well, it could even be an entry-level accent if you truly work on it as you are uh, studying, uh, when you can be described as speaking like a diplomat or like a scholar, that is, when your uh, speech uh, reflects the fact that you really worked on it, you really studied hard and well. Uh, and again, if you just come to a new country, a new language doing that, you probably will uh, sound bookish. You will perhaps uh, use uh, overly formal language and perhaps a little bit old-fashioned language, uh, and you will at any rate lack a colloquial touch, whereas if you work up to this level by living in the language, people just notice oh, you're, you're putting more and more effort into everything that you do and you're improving overall. Um, and then if you go and stay in a country for a long time, you immigrate to it, uh, eventually you will pick up a lot of the nuances and intonations and colloquialisms and you'll sound like it. And I would say that's the next uh, level of accent when uh, if people, particularly if they have any kind of critical ear, would still hear that in your basic phonetic patterning and your basic uh, lilt of your speech has a, a distinctiveness that can be traced back to the fact that you originally had a different imprint of a different language altogether, but uh, it's certainly not really perceptible or relevant, and you have uh, all the things that sound like you've been living in, in this other speech form, this other speech pattern, this other resonance for uh, decades or, or so. So you sound like uh, an immigrant of, of long residence would be, I think, the, the next basic uh, category of saying, well, this is a good accent. Um, and then perhaps uh, even better than that, as a foreign accent in a, in a new language, would be the point when uh, the natives of the region that you're in um, hear, again, something that your accent is not quite like theirs, but it's, it's so natural sounding and so uh, similar that they would assume, rather than assuming that you're a foreigner speaking a foreign language, they would assume that you are a, na a native speaker from some other region. Uh, you're in the north, uh, and so they think you're from the south for instance. And the final level of attainment, or the highest level on this uh, scale of ladder, would be the point when, even though you're not born and raised in this area, even though you came to it and learned this form of speech as an adult, the natives can't tell. They think that you're one of them. You, say, you can pass utterly for a native. You sound just like one of them. So with that as a frame of reference, uh, I wanted to talk about the, uh, uh, the importance of keeping a realistic perspective on the subject matter. And I feel a need to talk about this because uh, in my experience now uh, as a language teacher, and more than just as a, a professor of languages, but uh, as the director of foreign language education at the university for many years, where I had occasion to meet many students who were not my own and other teachers, uh, as somebody now who's focused my own life around foreign language learning, and as somebody now who's uh, developing more and more of a, an internet persona where uh, I get letters every day from people um, about language learning uh, on various forums and my own site, all these kinds of things, uh, I'm just aware of the fact that uh, a large numbers of people, lots and lots of people, when they think about this issue of 
accent formation and foreign language learning, um, really aspire to this last level, really aspire to sound just like native, sound just like the, the people who sp have spoken this language their whole lives long. So when it comes to perspective about that, uh, I invite you, listener, watcher, uh, to think about all the people whom you know who have learned a foreign language uh, and to think about how many of them have done this. You may say that you know somebody who has done this. Uh, I Again, I've heard lots of reports of people who say that they know somebody else who's done this. I've never met anybody personally who has uh, been able to truly speak, say, just the way that I do. Uh, and I think that they grew up uh, where I did. Uh, and then I find out, um, no, uh, this person actually just came from Pakistan or Latvia or Hong Kong two years ago and has learned the language since then. I've never learned, no, I've never met anybody who uh, can learn a foreign accent that well. Uh, that's not to say that these people don't exist. I have known people who are very good at it. I have had uh, many students in a class and a group of many students again at the university where I was uh, director of foreign language education and, and interacted with, with hundreds of students, I have seen uh, that there were, in any group, uh, some people who were just better at it than others, who with very little effort, uh, very little apparent effort, uh, not, no, nothing special that they did, were just able to achieve a more natural uh, sounding lilt and overall tone and timbre to their speech than the average uh, and just seemed really good at it. I've known people who are much better at it than I am, so I have no reason to believe that I've uh, met the acme of human talent in this regard, and uh, there may very well be people who can do this. Again, but I I've never met anybody, and most of the people that I've known have uh, been much, much lower down on the scale. Most of the people that I've known, even who are linguists or who are involved in language education, um, uh, are always retain some trace of a foreign accent, such that I would say that that is utterly the, the norm, the, the general standard rule. Uh, if you are a human being and you learn to speak uh, another language through force of study and intellectual effort, uh, uh, even by uh, just any kind of assimilation as an adult on top of another language that you've already learned in a more natural form as, as a child as you were growing up, you will always speak it with a foreign language. So uh, that's a perceptual gap, I would say, that there are so many students who want to speak to pass for a native uh, when there are so few people uh, that are capable of doing this. On the one hand, there's nothing wrong uh, with uh, aiming high, with aspiring. In many areas of life, um, this uh, means that you aim high and maybe you miss the target, but you still get pretty close to it. And this, this may well carry over here, and in that case, this is a good thing. But uh, I really wonder about that sometimes, because as I said, when, when uh, I've had many students come up to me uh, and when they're just beginning a language class and say something like, Professor, I'm, I'm really excited. I want to speak this language so well. I want to sound just like a native speaker. And I used to think, or sometimes I thought, that uh, perhaps you know, people use the term speak a language and know a language uh, all too often synonymously. And perhaps what they really meant when they said this was, uh, I, I totally want to master this language. I want to know it thoroughly. I want to know it just as well as I know my language. I want to know it just as well as people who grew up speaking it know it in, in every sense, reading, writing, thinking it, understanding it, appreciating it, knowing it in that sense. Well, uh, there may be some people who do that. Uh, but in the great majority of cases, no, this is, this is not what they mean. They mean it quite literally. They mean they want to sound like native speakers of languages of which they are not native speakers. And often they'll follow this up with some sort of information like that leads me to believe what, the, what they really are after is the experience of uh, entering into a conversation with a native speaker and in short order having that native speaker just sort of drop their jaw and, and fawn all over them and say, wow, you sound so good. You sound just like me. I can't believe that you're not just like me because you sound so good. Um, there is, I think, part of, uh, it's nice to be praised for your hard work in learning a foreign language. I certainly understand that. Uh, there's a little bit of natural human vanity there that, uh, again, is comprehensible. But I think it's not just a, 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 a sheer seeking after praise that people are after, but rather uh, a 
quite the opposite, uh, another factor making them want this thing that's so, so, so seldomly attainable um, is rather the reverse, that they don't want to sound funny, they don't want to sound strange, they don't want to sound odd. And unfortunately, as I said, you're always going to retain a foreign accent in any foreign language. That's the basic norm. Uh, and unfortunately, there are lots of uh, people for whom different or foreign is also synonymous with, uh, with funny or with, uh, with, 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 with funny. And so, yes, uh, when you learn to speak a foreign language, that's one of the many sort of fears you have to overcome and uh, steps you have to overcome is that some people are going to say or think that you sound funny, even if they don't say it. And I think um, a lot of students, uh, maybe because they do this to other people, uh, they know that and they, they hope to avoid this. They, they want to avoid this. So in terms of uh, perspective of attainability, there is this gap here. Um, and, but it, with some of these students, if I push it further and I say, well, why do you, why do you want to do that? Why do you think that you can do that? It's, it's a, a procedural question, too, because uh, often I would not just have this uh, vol information volunteered to me, but uh, I would go, say, into the language laboratory, and I would see students sitting and just listening to recorded material, not speaking at all just listening. And I'd ask them why. And they would say then to me that they, uh, they didn't want to speak because they didn't want to sound funny. Uh, they wanted to speak only when they knew that they could sound just like a native speaker. So uh, somehow they thought that just by listening they would uh, be able to attain that, which I discussed in some of the prior videos. I, I don't think it works all that well as a technique as, as opposed to speaking. Making mistakes and correcting your mistakes is I think the only real way to develop and improve your accent. Um, but even more beyond that, it's sort of a question I always wondered is, okay, maybe you don't know this procedure, but all the same, I mean, how are you going to know that you speak like, you sound like a native if, if you never speak? When are you going to start doing that? Um, but again, pushing the desirability, if I would ask them, well, why, why do you want to do that? Uh, the most cogent answers that I get, one that really has some sense behind it as well, you know, pe people treat you differently if you sound like one of them. I mean, you know, if you sound just like them, they'll, they'll think that you're just like them and they'll open up to you. They'll, they'll share things with you. Um, they'll take you places and, you know, show you things that they might not show you if they uh, are at all necessarily even xenophobic, but, you know, they just treat foreigners differently from uh, the way they treat their own. And so if I can pass as one of their own, because I sound like one of their own, I'll, I'll get different, maybe better treatment, or I'll get more insight into the culture. Uh, again, this is, uh, there's, there's logic and uh, solidity behind this, uh, this, this way of thinking. And uh, more than that, there are some circumstances I can think of when uh, it's almost really necessary some circ well, at least one circumstance. I mean, if you're involved in espionage warfare, you're a spy, uh, your ability to uh, penetrate the enemy's intelligence and uh, carry out your mission and even just keep your own life, stay alive, are going to depend upon your passing uh, for something that you're not. So the first line of defense uh, would be sounding just like uh, one of the natives. But uh, this, in point of fact, when you stop and think about it, or even get any kind of experience going out there, um, to sound like a native when you're not a native uh, is actually problematic, uh, can cause you a lot more troubles and headaches than, uh, than, than, not, than, than speaking with an accent. Um, what's going to happen uh, if you somehow do have that musical gift, you do have uh, that sort of perfect pitch and you're able to imitate sounds better than others and so very swiftly in your learning process you attain the feat of sounding like a native of a language of which you're not a language. Uh, well, are you simultaneously going to uh, master the grammar perfectly such that you never make any mistakes? The vocabulary, are you going to learn to use all the idioms and all the right terms, find the, the exact word that fits in the right place? Uh, you're never going to make a mistake in these levels. You're never going to misuse a word. You're never going to make a, an error that nobody's, uh, that no native speaker would make. I don't think so. And that's going to be the problem. Maybe they'll take you as one of them at first, and then when you make some mistake, maybe not on a phonetic level, but on another level, um, they're going to be disturbed. They're going to look and say, wait a minute, I thought you were one of us, uh, and you're not. Um, and this uh, very 
specific instance uh, in, in a realm of life that doesn't match mine, but I, I went to a conference not too long ago on, on learning languages to the superior level, a very high level of achievement, and most of the people there were, were diplomats, uh, government diplomats, and a lot of them spoke exactly of, of this problem and saying that, you know, when you go, when you're posted to a foreign country, and it's obvious that you, you know, are, you know, you're proficient in the language, but you haven't totally mastered it, then people accept you for that, and they don't mind that you make mistakes, and they're happy that you're learning their language, and they go out of their way to understand you and achieve you. But that when you get to a higher level, you have to make sure that you're higher level overall, and that you maintain that, because uh, mistakes are forgiven much less, uh, and this is not a conscious level, but at an unconscious level, such that um, when a diplomat goes into some sort of uh, serious negotiations and is being treated as an equal, as a, as a, as a, as a, part, as a linguistic uh, partner, somebody that you can talk with and communicate on every level, and then makes a mistake, a mistake that would be totally acceptable and not even perceived at a lower level, um, that they can often see uh, sort of the light of trust go out of the eyes of the people that they're talking to. And again, not consciously, but more unconsciously, the person thinking, wait a minute, I, th I thought that you were at the same level that I'm at, and, and you're not. Uh, and so I don't know how I can uh, communicate you with you now. This really can uh, throw up a barrier. And uh, I've seen this uh, myself in some, some other instances uh, where uh, that you know being taken uh, for a native speaker will really you know, they'll have expectations upon you uh, and they will not uh, forgive uh, any sort of uh, linguistic uh, weaknesses that if you had some accent still that you could speak with this would really be a line of defense imagine imagine that you speak just like I do and you're sitting next to me on the train and uh, the train stops and we're not going anywhere <clears throat> And I look at you, uh, and I say, uh, I'll use some sort of stereotypical accent and, and, and uh, you know, learners, stereotypical learner's grammar. I say something like, what wrong? Why train no move? Why we no go? What are you going to think of me? Well, you'll think that I'm a foreigner. You'll think that I'm someone from somewhere else, uh, and uh, I'm concerned that the train's not moving, and I'm asking you why it's not going. You'll understand me perfectly, and uh, there'll be no problem communicating. Well, what if I were to look at you and say, what wrong? Why we train no go? Why we, why we stop? Why we no go? You would think that that was really strange. I mean, there I'm really exaggerating the degree of, of uh, grammatic, you know, mis, uh, mismatch between my uh, grammatical and idiomatic syntax construction and my accent, but I'm doing that to, to make the point. Um, <clears throat> and I've experienced this myself uh, in, an, in another way. Um, Again, back when, uh, when I was a professor in Korea for many years at a university that wanted very much to be an international global university and to use English as the language of communication uh, and therefore uh, really sought out students from all over the world and particularly uh, tried to attract those who could uh, speak English well. Uh, and so this was in Korea, and the majority of the students were Korean Koreans who were struggling with the English language. And then there was a smaller contingent of people who uh, were Korean Americans mainly, or people from all over the world who'd been in American schools for some point uh, as a young person. And uh, on the surface of it, um, sounded like me, sounded like Native American speakers, but who did not have, uh, beyond that, uh, the sort of educational foundation that would go with it, or uh, the sort of the informational content that uh, these native, hardworking Native Korean students who'd uh, been to in their educational system. And so I didn't have any real um, official double standard in terms of my grading essays in particular, but I couldn't help but have some sort of uh, mismatch there too. I expected more in terms of uh, content and argument formation from those who seemed like they could uh, speak uh, like I did, uh, and I sort of was making allowances for the difficulties in expression for those who obviously had them, and in point of fact, I got better ideas and better argumentation from the uh, the, the Korean Koreans than from all uh, these other people who uh, had the, the veneer of smooth-sounding language, but on top of 
what was often uh, an imperfect ling linguistic structure. So uh, it did not help them at all to, uh, to sound uh, as if they were native speakers, when in point of fact they were not. Uh, and I would say that that is uh, a general rule. It's a, almost a line of defense for you, because you are going to be operating in, um, in uh, a, a territory of a position of weakness, as it were, uh, speaking a foreign language. You're not going to ever dominate it the way somebody who's a true native speaker is. And so if they think that you are, they're going to expect things. Whereas if they know that you're not, they're going to allow things for you. Uh, and so this is uh, some one one of the mismatches, one thing that I've observed, and lack of perspective and um, uh, desire of achieving a perfect accent and ability to achieve a perfect accent. Uh, and as I said before, there are some people who may well be able to do this. There are some people who can do it very well, can go high up on that scale, who can sound like they've lived in a country for a long time when they haven't, or maybe sound like they're from a different region uh, of the country, and maybe even just sound like they're right from there when they've not been. Um, so, uh, because so many people aspire to that, um, how are they going to see that? They tend to, I think, uh, almost admire that uh, too much uh, and think that if uh, those people can do it, perhaps I can do it by dint of hard work or, or by dint of really applying myself, by valuing accent more. Um, it's always good to try more, to try harder, but uh, as I've articulated throughout this, this long through four-part lecture now. I think that uh, accent formation, while it can be contingent, certainly upon the technique uh, that you use, upon how much you open your mouth, uh, your, your, the, the patterns that you follow, the, model, the models that you use, um, these certainly can have an influence on, on the accent that you form. But um, more than anything else, what's involved is sheer natural talent. I mean, it's a question of learning to hear and repeat hear, perceive, and then imitate a whole range of sounds that in your formation process, your growing up process, your maturation process, you've learned not to hear. You've learned to just sort of push to the background of sounds. And that is, uh, to me, a question of perhaps talent is one way of phrasing it, or just sort of, again, sort of s uh, strength in terms of uh, vision or perception. Uh, some people are better at that than others. And so uh, when I see somebody who can do that really well, um, I may feel a bit, you know, not envious in the sense that I hold it uh, against them, but uh, jealous, just wishing perhaps I had that a little bit more. But it's really impossible f for me to feel any sense of, um, admiration that this person has achieved something, whereas I have known people who have been stuck uh, at a plateau of a, uh, of, on that scale, rather low plateau, a thick accent, an ugly accent, and just seemed like they could never do anything with it, uh, and then uh, had some sort of really bad experience, uh, humiliating experience in giving a presentation, say, and make some new resolve that they're going to get a coach, an accent coach, and they're going to go through some accent reduction courses and uh, push themselves up a good notch or two. Uh, I think that's worthy of admiration when somebody really makes uh, that effort. But um, if you uh, think that people who have a natural talent for it have uh, achieved something, I think this is only true if they really achieve the uh, skill in the language overall. And that's the, the final thing, perspective, uh, that I would like to talk about, uh, is that there is not necessarily uh, any relationship whatsoever between somebody's accent and their overall knowledge of the language. If somebody has a thick foreign accent, what does that mean? Well, really it means that they grew up speaking another language and uh, that they have not been able to sort of integrate themselves into this new sound system. And that can and uh, often is a trigger that they're new to it and haven't learned the language all that well. But as a university professor, I've known so many other, the, the stereotype almost of the, the foreign scholar, the foreign professor who speaks with that low level accent, the really thick, frankly speaking, almost ugly accent that you have to pay attention to, but is a genius and really has great ideas and thought and expression and knows lots of things. And uh, along those lines, just in the uh, realm of language learning, 
I'll say that at that uh, conference I mentioned before, uh, which had language teachers and language learners from all over the world, uh, they're all professionals involved in language teaching at the highest levels here, uh, and not one of those people did not have an accent. Uh, not one of those people sounded as if they were native English speakers when they were not. And uh, a clear, perfect example of that would be that people here, self-learners who study languages, can easily check and think of would be the uh, the renowned language teacher, Michel Thomas, who uh, you can listen to him on a lot of his own recordings, where he has a, a teaching method of getting people to uh, speak uh, foreign languages very swiftly, uh, helping them learn very fast and effortlessly, and he does this by talking them through the whole process. So you can hear him talking English, which he lived in for 50 years and never had anything like a nice sounding decent accent and people say too that some of his other foreign languages are uh, in terms of accent not that well but his grammar is impeccable his uh, his knowledge of phonetics his knowledge of how language structure works is all there so the fact that somebody has an accent does not mean that they don't know the language the fact that somebody is without an accent uh, might mean, generally does tend to mean that they're some sort of native level, but if they're just these musically talented, perfect pitch people, uh, that doesn't go hand in hand either. So uh, I think really uh, people who almost put too much stress on accent, I mean, it's very important. Nobody, no, I would never say it's not an important thing that you should, uh, you know, sort of slight to any degree or form, but it's not an area of language learning when uh, sweat and effort and assiduity really produce high results. Uh, you can uh, really put a lot of effort into developing your vocabulary or to developing other uh, areas of language learning, but uh, if you really force a lot of effort into uh, accent production, it's not necessarily going to uh, produce results. There's basically not much that you can do. And that's the final question of perspective, I would say. Uh, is that if you become too uh, obsessed, too focused on this area of language learning, when you hear other people talking uh, and they have accents, I think this will probably tend to make you a bit too judgmental. Uh, and that's not generous, uh, that's not charitable, that's not kind, because uh, most people are doing the best that they can even if they have very thick accents, even if they are unable to uh, do uh, to, to find that other point of resonance. Uh, they're probably frustrated with that, too. I, I, uh, I can't think of uh, a personality type that I know of uh, that is totally oblivious to it, that is careless about accent things. Oh, it doesn't matter. I can speak anyway, and I'll sound fine. I'm just I'm not going to put any effort into this, and I don't care. Um, I think that's just not the case. I think nobody wants to sound funny, and everybody tries to sound the best that they can. I think that everybody you know, who, who loves foreign languages ought to learn foreign languages, and we ought to encourage each other to learn them, uh, and not be uh, hypercritical about the uh, way that people, uh, other people sound. Let's just be aware that uh, they're probably uh, doing the best they can, even if it's not very good. Um, so. Uh, these, I suppose, are my uh, concluding thoughts on the overall subject of accent formation and foreign language learning. Uh, I hope this lecture has been helpful and interesting to you. Um, since I'm concluding it now, uh, it's kind of I'm getting more and more used to speaking in front of the camera. I would inclined to, after my dozen years of university lecturing, I want to look out and see some hands and answer some questions, but. Uh, just have to conclude by looking into the camera, as I've been doing all along, uh, and say that, uh, again, I hope this has been useful and helpful, and uh, I'm happy of the response that uh, I'm getting in terms of interest in my uh, videos and my ideas about language learning. And so now that this lecture is done, there will certainly be many, be many more and many other subjects coming up soon. So 